Hello and welcome to Bookworms. It's the show where we read a book and then talk about that book. I'm your host, Alex. And I'm Joe. How you doing, Joe? No good, Alex. All right. What do what did we read for story time this time? We got a we got a hell of a book for you. Well, it's a hell of a book for Alex, maybe. You know, if you're into children's literature. I sure am. Yeah, this was an Alex pick. So I'm glad you thank everyone for putting up with it. I know some of Alex's picks have been kind of uh, duds, like this one. <laughs> oh, this book is a stud, all right? You got the duds. Whatever. Hit me with a liar like that. How dare you? You liked it. <laughs> I'm pretty sure I'm on the record it's not. <laughs> I think. I think you're just trying to create controversy, come up with a fake story. Fake news here. <laughs> alternative facts, I think we're calling them now. Oh, okay. So politically correct term. <laughs> oh, we're getting all PC now, are we? <laughs> oh, yes, yes. Well, it's a, it's a kid's book. we gotta, we got to be respectful and polite and show good manners. So, what is this book, Alex? This book... What did, is... what did you drag everyone through this month? What <laughs> you drag them through? This book takes like an hour and a half to read. I did everyone a favor. Uh, we, we did give them a month to read it, Alex. You got to give them something to you know get, really sink their teeth into here. They could read it like once a day for thirty days. <laughs> Be really why, familiar. Why, why would you uh, want to torture yourself with, uh, that way? Oh my goodness, you are a monster. This book is so sweet and heartwarming. I can't believe you would say that. If you like torture and uh, self harm, <laughs> you, know, you know this rabbit does get tortured quite a bit. So it's nice. <laughs> it's nice if you're into that. <laughs> so. The book. Yes, the book. The Miraculous Journey of Edward Tulane by Kate DiCamillo. It is the best book about a China rabbit you will ever read. I'll take your word for it. <laughs> it's probably the only one, too. Yeah, so I chose this book because Kate DiCamillo is one of my favorite authors. Uh, she's got just a wonderful way with words. She's an excellent children's writer. Um, as evidenced by the just sheer number of awards that her books win. And uh, this is definitely one that's near the top of the heap. Like, I don't know, she has a couple that I, you know, I can't decide between which ones are my favorite. But I went with this one because um, I first bought it. I read it in a day. And, like, it just has this huge emotional heft to it. And I wanted to talk about it with you. See, see how you'd like it. I see. So, if I recall, this is the book that... Out of the eight we picked, we all picked seven books we liked, and then one book we th we didn't like. But this was you took that wrong as eight books you like, and one but one of them is one you think I would hate. Yeah. So this is the one that you think I would hate. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I'm going to tell you a little secret here. Stuffed is still worse. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll, we'll start there. Okay. Okay. <laughs> all right. I didn't hate it. Okay. It just kind of meh. 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 You got a meh rating. Yeah. Two and a half stars. <laughs> Two and a half stars. So yeah. 50%. Yes. So that's a failing grade. Yes, but in the star system, that's average. Oh, boy. Okay. So, yeah, we're going to we're gonna have some fighting then. Okay. Or so maybe slightly below average. Because three stars is usually like, it's okay. It's good. I, I didn't hate reading it. Two and a half is like, it wasn't quite there. It was just meh. All right. All right. We're going to have to argue then, I guess. I guess go so. to war. But first. Two gonna... go in, one comes out. Yeah. <laughs> but first, I'm going to read the back of the book. Once in a house on Egypt Street, there lived a China rabbit named Edward Tulane. The rabbit was very pleased with himself, for he was owned by a girl named Abilene, who treated him with the utmost care and adored him completely. Then one day, he was lost. And much like the back of the book, everything here is very brief, succinct, to the point, and I just absolutely love this writing style. I'm like ready to dive in. I'm super excited. Yeah, I was really hoping to prove Alex wrong and actually enjoy this book, but so I just never could really get into it. Edward is just kind of obtuse and annoying, and obtuse and annoying. <laughs> Well, he starts up too and annoying, and then he has this incredible growth throughout his journey. It's very, you might call it miraculous. Oh, oh, okay. I see what yes. you're doing here with the title. Hey. 
So, let's get into the story. Okay. It says, even though we know all you people have read it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, of course. Everyone reads along. Like, yeah. I don't even know why we do these 45-minute summaries. Like Everyone knows what's going to happen. Pretty much. It's kind of like the 372 Pages guys do those long summaries, even though they know everyone read those horrible books. Uh, but yeah, we, uh, we open the book with uh, just a nice description of... Edward and the setting of, or the first setting of the story. Once in a house on Egypt Street, there lived a rabbit who was made almost entirely out of china. He had china arms and china legs, china paws and a china head, a china torso and a china nose. His arms and legs were jointed and joined by wire so that his china elbows and china knees could be bent, giving him freedom of movement. So we get this nice, like, rhythm to it like the description is almost entirely just like one word like he's made out of china we get it it's uh i don't know it's kind of brings you in it sets that tone right away of the story's gonna just be very succinct fast deliveries and it goes from there we learn that edward uh like he's just a toy rabbit he is like I don't yeah know. he's a ob- passive observer of life of course like you know my cynical mind i'm thinking how is it that he is not totally insane and just batshit crazy? <laughs> because he basically just sits there and has nothing to do but listen and be a, a wallflower. And you know, even the, like the positions the little girl puts him in, he can't really see anything. And he doesn't really want to listen to people because he's so self-centered and just annoying that all he can think about is how great he is and... How everyone should adore him, even though the parents just kind of, oh yeah, he's okay, he's cute. Yeah, the story starts off where like Edward, he's very vain and proud of himself. He knows he's this beautiful thing, and he takes for granted the love that he receives. Like he doesn't even like recognize it as love. He's just like, oh well, I obviously deserve. Like he's almost like a cat. Like I obviously deserve what is happening right now, and this is good for me. This is good. I deserve this. This is what I deserve. And that's, he just kind of goes, kind of just lives his life that way where he, yeah, he observes everything and he's got a conscious mind. And even though he can't move without, you know, someone moving him for him, he, he doesn't really see it as that way. I did want to like quickly back out of the book real quick and uh, talk about the cover of the book because it's very misleading because it looks like he's like a walking, talking yeah, miniature but that, rabbit. But that's uh, his dream. Yeah, and that winds up being a dream sequence in the story, but it is a little misleading because it's like it says "miraculous journey" and it shows a rabbit walking towards a building, and then like it's not really anything like that except for one scene. Yeah, I, but they they did pull it from the story, so it's not totally misleading. Yeah, it's a little misleading. It's a little misleading. It's not like Butcher and the Red misleading with that description. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that cover description. <laughs> yeah, well they, yeah. There's all those quotes on about it, saying this is a good book. Well, I just meant the you know, the, the description, of, like the the summary of the book there that they give, where they say all these things like that. None of that actually happens. Yeah, it's like <laughs> disgusting body horror. And all these things. It's like no, it's just a, some dude with bad catchphrases. But yeah, so back to the story. Uh, we get to the point where the the grandmother also lives with the little girl and her parents, and. She, the little girl is always begging for stories from the grandmother. And she's always saying no until one night when they find out they're going to go on this big trip. And the grandmother, who kind of knows there's something more to Edward than meets the eye than just a toy, you know, you know, they they never explicitly say it, but she she tells a story that's you know meant for Edward, even though she's telling the girl, and it does not end well for the the character of the story. Yeah, she tells a story about a princess who's very vain and selfish, and, and yeah, gets, bad stuff happens yeah, to her. And gets butchered and uh, roasted like a pig. Yeah, she gets tra- yeah, which transforms <laughs> her into a pig, and her like parents like shoot her and cook her and eat her. And uh, that winds up being like a metaphor for Edward's journey. As he goes along, he keeps thinking about that story. And there's a very strange interaction between Edward and the grandmother. Like after she tells that story, she like sets Edward next to Abilene, Abilene and uh, tells him, like, you disappoint me. So, yeah, yeah, she does seem to know that there's more to Edward than meets the yeah, eye. She, it's almost like some people can almost think or know what Edward's thinking, and they just 
you know, they feed off of his energy. Yeah, they never treat him like he's just a doll. No. As an observer, like he's not just a cat passive observer. Like he's like actively involved with what's going around him because people talk to him, people confide in him. I guess what I'm saying lives. he's a passive observer is that because he literally can't talk back or you know, everything's happening to him. There's nothing he can do to change his outcome. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it's all in his head of how his outlook of the outcome. But yeah, so they go on to this ship to go sailing across an ocean and some boys take Edward and humiliate him and then th- throw him off the ship. Yeah, they uh, strip off all of his fine clothing and throw him overboard because they want to harass the little girl. So, and then he, uh, uh, that's where his journey starts. Yeah. He starts learning valuable lessons about life. All he had to do was spend about seven years, or almost a year at the bottom of the ocean. Yep. Being tumbled around by the current. Yeah, and this is a interesting bit as he's like f- floating down to the bottom of the uh, water. Uh, it says, far above him, the ocean liner with Abilene aboard it sailed blithely on, and the China rabbit landed finally on the ocean floor, face down, and there, with his head in the muck, he experienced his first genuine and true emotion. Edward Tulane was afraid. I I had actually starred that phrase also, because it, you know it, it is kind of a a trope that authors will do is like the first real emotion, but Edward had real emotions before. They were just self centered emotions, selfish, vain emotions. Yeah, pride, vanity. Yeah. So this was the first, and you know this one was still self centered where he's afraid, but this is the first time where he like he's able to name. An emotion where before he's again just kind of passive about them and just say it is what it is, you know. I guess, you know, so that was just kind of one of those little annoying things I had, you know, I find with writing is first time you ever felt an emotion, it's like, yeah, that's not really true. It's first time you could name the emotion or name the emotion. Yeah, that's a good observation. I like that. Good job. Thanks, Alex. Yeah. I can't tell if you're being sarcastic or not. <laughs> No, that's good. That's good. You did a good job. I'm proud of you. Still can't tell if you're being sarcastic <laughs> or not. <laughs> so, anyway, yeah, he's at the uh, bottom of the ocean for a little while, and then a uh, storm kicks up, and it kicks him up back at higher level into the water, and he gets caught in a fisherman's net and hauled up to shore. And the fisherman takes an immediate liking to the rabbit and takes him home to his old wife, who makes... Uh, dress for Edward and calls him Suzanne. Yeah, funny thing, like, he meets a lot of people on his journey and they all call him different things. Why do you think that is? Because they don't, you know, they just need to name him and or they need to name objects and mm-hmm. he needs a name. And Edward, you know, they, they don't get into how Edward was named Edward. But, I mean, obviously to him, his first name is his real name. So, but they said they don't say, like, you know, you know, where he got the name from, Edward. But these people just find a random doll, and they're going to be like, oh, this looks like an Edward or a Suzanne or a, um, Mr. Rabbit, whatever. <laughs> yeah, I think a lot of it has to do, like, being lost, he it starts this, like, quest for him finding his own identity. But, but and... it's also, you know, a, a thing from the, the people that name him. It's their, what they're kind of searching for, like the the old fisherman and his wife. You know, they have a daughter who's just kind of... Oh, know, their daughter's a monster. Oh, she's a total bitch. And <laughs> so they... But they want that perfect little girl that they probably raised and they're, they've are they lost. So they got this rabbit. They're like, hey, this is Suzanne. This, you know, and he's the, the old fisherman is taking Edward out on his shoulder in the, the dress and ta- walking around town pointing out to, to people saying, hey, so-and-so is this, so-and-so did that. And, it, you know, and everyone in town thinks the old man's crazy. But then at you know at the house the the wife is you know doing her wifely things baking or sewing or whatever and you know chit chatting and just gossiping with Edward as if Edward were a real person and you know like their their child yeah it's a little bit of like I guess both both work because like Edward's trying to find himself and also yeah like Nellie and the Nellie and her husband are trying to almost like recapture. A time when their house was, you know, had children in it, and they were looking forward to having that, or they enjoyed having that family, 
uh, dynamic between them rather than their daughter who seems to only be visiting them out of obligation and is very imposing on them. Um, I think it's like a clearly like, yeah, they just, they miss having that child parent interaction that they used to have, even if it does make them a little crazy. I like how the, the daughter is claiming the rabbit's casting spells on them. He's like, again, she's kind of that person that says, Hey, there's something more to this rabbit. Like kind of like the grandmother and you know, Edward's still not quite there for his selfless thoughts. So he's still kind of selfish and self important and feels that, you know, he needs, you know, that, that, or has that right to being the center of attention. And so that the, you know, the daughter who's selfish and vain and whatnot can't handle the competition and is jealous. But again, she's, like I was saying, she kind of has that feeling that there's something more to Edward than just, you know, a, a toy. So yeah. she throws Edward into the, the garbage. Yeah. Now with that interaction with that, with the sailor and his wife, he starts learning what love is. I don't think he experiences love fully with that. Again, family. he can't, he can't name it. Yeah, I can't name it, but there's a there's a little bit where he was remembering that story that uh, the grandmother, Pellegrina, had been telling them. And uh, it just says, uh, he remembered again Pellegrina's story about the princess who had loved nobody. The witch turned her into a warthog because she loved nobody. He understood that now. He heard Pellegrina say, you disappoint me. Why, he asked her, why do I disappoint you? But he knew the answer to that question, too. It was because he had not loved Abilene enough, and now she was gone from him, and he would never be able to make it right. And Nellie and Lawrence were gone too. He missed them terribly. He wanted to be with them. So yeah, he winds up at the dump, and he's, he's kind of buried thinking in about garbage and buried in garbage. So he can't even see. So it's basically pitch black again. My whole thing of he should be just bonkers, insane right now. Just stuck in his head, and you know, solitary confinement, no sensory anything, and. Yeah, there's a little, like, suspension of belief, like, maybe he processes time differently or something like well, that. I, I think, yeah, I don't think that. I think it's just a, the, a kid's story, so that's exactly what it is. You know, it's, you know, th- there's no deeper thought in that. It's just me being my cynical old man self. <laughs> yeah. uh, but he's eventually dug up by a dog and brought yes. to a hobo. Ah, uh, yes. And the hobo, what does the hobo name him? Uh, Gosh. The... the Hobo is named Bull, and the dog is named Lucy. What was it? Malone? The, Malone the Outlaw. And the hobo treats Edward as his companion, traveling companion. And he, uh, at this point, says, you know, kind of, you know, you're lost, we're all lost, which we'll get into later, I'm sure. Yeah, he spends the next seven years with Bull. Uh, kind of yeah, Just going, can... back, going back and forth across the country by the rail system and going to hobo camps and... Yeah, there's like, and he just, he almost enjoys just being lost. Yeah. Like, with no, like, nowhere really, like, he's not looking to be found. He, they're just like, yeah, we're lost. We're gonna, we're just an, on an adventure, and there's no, there's no, like, end yeah, goal. And yeah, this mind. is important. We forgot to mention it for the fisherman. The fisherman was teaching uh, Edward about the stars and the constellations. And Edward, while he's with a hobo at night, studies the, the stars oftentimes and, you know, just kind of follows them. That's kind of like his finding his path. So that that's an important trope that keeps getting brought up over and over again. And that's like a big thing with uh, Kay DiCamillo. I was actually reading another book of hers, one of her new, newer ones, The Puppets of Spellhorst, which is another similar thing with like inanimate objects that can think critically. And she like keeps referencing like the stars and looking at the stars and experiencing the world, the beauty of the world, with uh, through the eyes of a something that can't move or communicate. But still has feelings. Yeah. So yeah, that's kind of a, it's kind of a common theme in her yeah, storytelling. Right, right, well, you know, right? Yep. I know stars. <laughs> yeah. So they're traveling around, and Edward is starting to en- enjoy stuff that's not just centered on him. Meeting all the different other hobos and bums and homeless people, and he starts taking an interest in other people's lives. Yeah. That um, even if they don't, you know. Uh, like even if they don't include him, he wants to but, hear but about even, it. Even you know, he points out that, yeah, first everyone's just kind of looking at uh, Bull there and thinking he's a crazy guy carrying around this doll, you know, in his backpack. 
you know, watching over his shoulder. And then eventually they kind of just come to accept him and say, yeah, well, you know, they're, they're saying hi to him at the, when they all come into the fire, you know, campfires and all that stuff and treating him with, you know, the respect that Edward still feels he deserves. But at the same time, he's like, Hey, you know, I've earned my place in this group. Yeah. Like bull becomes almost like a legend among the hobos. Cause he's the hobo with the rabbit. Yep. You all got to have your, uh, your signature piece on you, right? Exactly. <laughs> Yeah, so eventually they get separated, though, because Bull hops onto a train car and the uh, train police catch him and throw the rabbit over over the side of the rails. Yeah, yeah. It's, a, it's, a, it's a kind of a sad scene. Well, it's a very sad scene. It's, it's a very sad yeah. book. I mean, because he keeps getting ripped away from all these people in these fairly traumatic ways. Yeah, it's like a really good just study on loss and recovery mm-hmm. and longing and hope. And how to, like, process and overcome it. Uh, but, yeah, he lose like, him and Bull get separated. He never gets to see Bull ever again. Yeah. And some little old lady finds him and crucifies him. Yeah, not, not biblical at all. Like, the, the uh, even, like, the picture at the start of the chapter has him set up, like, a scarecrow on the, uh, on a farm. And it's very clearly, like, oh, yeah, this is, this is a biblical imagery right here. Yeah, and uh, he's supposed to be scaring away the birds, but as most scarecrows do, they just attract them, and he's being pecked at the face by crows and whatnot, and basically he loses all hope. He just you know, becomes ultra-depressed and basically wants to just give up and hope he dies. Yeah, there's uh, so there's a lot of illustrations in the book, too, to, you know, kind of like, uh, not quite like... Absolutely true. Diary of Part Time Indian. They're just like panels, and they'll have like a little quote from the book underneath them. But yeah, the one with him on the in in the field on the post, it, it does help yeah. make the book go even quicker. Yeah, <laughs> it's always like a bonus. Like even for adult books, when there's like a little break in the text, they're like, "Thank God, all right, I don't have to spend too much time on that page." But yeah, he's uh he's dressed in rags. He's nailed to a cross, and he's looking at the stars, and he's saying, "I have been loved." He's like desperately just trying to hold on to some glimmer of hope in his life but there's really he feels there's none left to be had and but a boy who's working in the field sees the rabbit and yeah Bryce yeah and decides that he should take the rabbit for his sick little sister yeah this is uh this is definitely it, like the like Bryce's story which runs through this like latter half of the book is probably the most tragic Thing, one of the tragic things I've ever read in a children's book before. That's yeah, it is, you know, you're, considering that this really is a children's sad. book, this is like brutal. Like I can't imagine reading this to my kids and then be like, "Huh, that was fun." They'd be like, "But, but what? <laughs> why? Why did that happen?" Just questions upon questions, and them hating it because it's just it doesn't end happy. Yeah. So Bryce is a little boy. Uh, his sister's dying. His father is neglectful, abusive, and drunkard. And uh, he sees Edward hanging up in the field that he's working in. So he sneaks in at night, takes Edward down, brings him to his sister so that she has something to play with, even though she's ill. And Edward becomes the the little girl's plaything until she passes. Yeah, basically she's got some sort of pneumonia or cough, but they're so dirt poor. It's a one ho- one room house, and the dad just comes back long enough to smack his kids around, and then he uh, goes back out on his binging, and the girl's just slowly dying, coughing, hacking away. Yeah, and and, it, uh, and she loves her rabbit fiercely. Yeah, this uh, he's her uh, Sarah Ruth is her name. Oh. She. Uh, he's her. She's nah, Edward is her rabbit for like the last five months of her life, and uh, just you know the and whole basically scene, the whole scene happens really fast, but yeah. it is it has a huge yeah. Just and, and basically Edward has got becomes so you know because he sees her suffering, cares for her so much mm-hmm. that you know basically when she dies and he sees Bryce and his father fighting over the uh, Sarah Ruth's dead body, he just you know like what the hell. So that was probably the, the one thing that kind of ruined the, the scene for me was them fighting over the body because it was they were trying to take basically possession over her and it was you know it was it felt wrong you know no I mean, it's, it's I know that's probably how it would have worked in real life yeah. but it just 
it it, it kind of lost a little bit of its you know sadness, you know. Oh, I saw it as it enhanced the sadness because like you see that the it shows a little peels back a layer on the father and you see that he's also hurting. He's not just this caricaturist, you know, drunk monster. He's someone who's unable to handle the loss of his daughter. And I don't know, you see that too when like he broken his relationship with Bryce and it's you know, you feel more for Bryce, obviously, and yeah. like he's still a bad person who gave up on his family but you see that too where like all he really ever says about it is like like bryce says you never even loved her you don't know nothing about love and all he says is i loved her i loved her there's like so in that middle of the argument you get this like moment where you're like oh there's more to this than just meets the eye and like that's why he's reacting this way Mm -hmm. i was gonna read the whole death scene but um, I highly recommend you pick up this book and read it yourself because oh, it's better better enjoyed that way than having me read it aloud. Yeah, your reading aloud does kind of suck. So. I'm a master at reading aloud. Fuck you. <laughs> we, we all know people would rather hear me stumbling over my words. <laughs> yeah, we need a good laugh. But yeah, Bryce, uh, after uh, the dad takes Sarah Ruth away, Bryce runs away. He takes Edward, um, grabs some cash, and goes to Memphis. Yeah, I mean, and Edward is kind of in the uh, bargaining stage of his uh, love and loss, where you know, in his grief, or because he's had so much grief and he's trying to make deals, and you know, with the fates or the stars or himself, and he's kind of at this point still kind of really self-centered. He hasn't, you know, he's grown, but he's still me, 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 me. You know, because he's, you know, yeah, he's just basically just letting Bryce do what he will with him while he just kind of wallows in his self-misery. Yeah, yeah, he starts getting lower and lower on himself. You know, just more self-loathing, less drive, and he's starting to give up on life and trying and just accepting the fact that, you know, he's never going to continuously experience true happiness ever again. And Bryce is, you know panhandling on the street is just a homeless child with a little dancing china yeah, rabbit yeah he's trying to play harmonica while dancing this rabbit and people are just looking at him like what the fuck is this <laughs> and he yeah. basically makes enough money to buy himself a coffee goes to this yeah, place and buys that. himself a feast yeah yeah uh, you know he goes to a diner he's st- clearly starving yeah. and uh what I didn't get was why the woman actually gave him all the food without uh without evidence that he had the money to pay you can tell she's like do you really have the money kind of attitude but then she just yeah okay whatever you want kid i didn't get that yeah i think she kind of set him up for failure almost on purpose i don't know if she purposely did it or if there was just some like kindness in her art like you know there's a starving child in front of you let's give him some food and hope for the best yeah but i mean but you you, you, you orders half the menu you say okay kid we'll give you We'll give you this. Give me whatever money you got, and I'll cover the rest. Instead of you got enough money for the coffee or the milk you ordered, but none of the food. You know, okay, and I just gave you thirty dollars worth of food. Yeah, so that was the you know, the, the unbelievable part there for me. Yeah, but it it uh, definitely definitely works out poorly for Bryce because yeah. the he can't pay, and then the head chef comes out and smashes Edward. Yeah, and then Edward learns that there's uh worse fates than being broken into a million pieces because he yeah. was this whole time he at this point he's just hoping to be smashed and to you know he hopes die and this is where we kind of get into his dream sequence yep yeah, where, where he, sequence. he thinks he's in porcelain heaven yeah yeah ra- rabbit heaven uh all the people that he ever lost throughout the story are there and uh uh, it's kind of one of those like near death things where you know you're surrounded by your loved ones. They tell you it's not your time, and then you, they send you back. It's like one of those scenes. Yep. And so they send him back, and uh, he's at a doll maker's house. Yeah, the doll maker is putting him back together. Apparently, yeah, Bryce was able to get all the pieces swept up before he got thrown out, and was able to take the doll maker, who kind of a jerk, but yeah, you know, I kind of get it too. Like he's. You know, he's looking at the profit he's going to make off of repairing the doll, and but then he's like, you know, the boy who's obviously attached to this thing because it's the last memory of his, you know, his little sister, 
wants to, you know, find a way to keep it, but he's just too dirt poor and not smart enough to find a way to, you know, no no means really to ever buy the rabbit back. Yeah, Bryce in his uh, desperation to save Edward, he has to make a deal with the doll maker where, like, he can't pay to have Edward repaired, so the doll maker gets to keep Edward after he repairs him. And so, yeah, he has to give up the so one thing that's tying him to his, or one, like, relic of his sister's life. And so, uh, yeah, the doll maker keeps him. There's, like, there's really another really heartbreaking scene where yeah. Bryce comes into the doll shop and just asks to give Edward one last hug, and he's told no, and he's sent out again. But this is also where Edward finally moves on in his growth, where he finally grows into a a real kid, a real human kind of thing, where it's not about himself it's about Bryce he's like poor Bryce you know he's yeah that like transformation is complete yeah I mean he's still kind of self-centered in that he doesn't want to ever love again because he's afraid of the loss and he has to have a conversation with another doll to kind of unlock that hope of love again yeah yeah, they, but, yeah but he is past just his me attitude his vain attitude and it's now about making other people happy yeah, there's a, uh, like the scene where Bryce leaves the store. Just like it's really, I don't know, I'll read that part. I'll break your heart with that part. So, yeah. Goodbye, said Bryce. Don't go, thought Edward. I won't be able to bear it if you go. And now you must leave, said Lucius Clark, who's the doll man. Yes, sir, said Bryce. But he stood without moving, looking at Edward. Go, said Lucius Clark. Go. Please, Edward thought. Don't. Bryce turned. He walked through the door of the doll mender's shop. The door closed, the bell tinkled, and Edward was alone. And he's alone for quite a long time. Yeah, seemed like another year or so anyways. He said he has that conversation with the other doll that's yep. next to him. Because he, at first he's kind of like, you know, refuses to talk to the other dolls because they're all uh, human dolls and he's the only, you know, animal. Yeah, and so they kind of all like, oh, we're we're too different from you. You're, this is a doll shop, not a uh, rabbit shop, and and that's also a good way to show how much he's changed because all those dolls are similar to how he was at the beginning of the story. Yeah. But then he gets put up against another doll that was fixed that had lots of cracks, and she's you know had been around for a hundred years or yeah. whatever. And that's and... actually a uh, clear reference to a different book. Oh. So it's a reference to another book about that's got a very similar style about a an inanimate object that has human thoughts called Hitty, her first hundred years, and it's a, it chronicles the hundred years life of a uh, doll. Uh, it's by Rachel Field. It's actually pretty good. It's from like nineteen thirty children's book. Okay. Yeah. Better than this book? No, no, no. This book's this book. Okay, better. so so this one still beats out for uh, China dolls. <laughs> <laughs> yes, the best book about a doll. Okay. Uh, but yeah, then uh, kind of Edward goes back into his own head and starts trying to piece things together and think things out. And he, this is kind of when he realizes that the metaphor from the grandmother about the, the princess turning into warthog, and he, he's going back through his adventures and so oh, I was the princess that got turned into the warthog. And... Because I couldn't love anybody, and even though I've loved, you know, all I'd had was loss and pain, and but it was better to love than not love. He realized, like, he had been loved, and then by that point he realizes, now I know what love is. You know, it was like, and it's completely changed me, and that story doesn't really apply to him anymore. Yeah, but yeah, he, he realized that his loss of hope and his cynicism is just as ugly as his vainness, too. Then the one day a little girl walks into the store and picks him out, and we find out that the little girl's mother is Abilene. Abilene, yeah, yeah. So he's been gone for it's unclear like exactly how long he was gone, but it's been probably about twenty years. Yeah, about that uh, of of his life. So now Abilene's grown up with a daughter of her own, and, they go and, to and she recognizes shop. Edward immediately. Yeah, and the the, uh, the store clerk there is getting all. I'm bothered because the little girl is hugging Edward and he's freaking out that the merchandise is being manhandled by this little kid and and this is I guess and, uh, and the woman didn't want to buy anything they just walked into to browse and the shopkeeper wasn't exactly happy with that either and then but then she sees Edward and is like nope guess what we're doing we're buying Edward what's your price 
<laughs> yep, and then he's uh, so he goes through this journey and he experiences all this redemption and he learns what love is and um, he can he can feel love and he can give it back in return and then he's almost I guess we'll call it recalled to life where he's yeah. reunited with yes. you know his yes. first love yes first full circle yeah full circle full circle so that's the story it just kind of ends so yeah his journey's over yep final thoughts Alex. I gave this book five stars. It's uh, it's an emotional juggernaut for being such a short book. From what I was reading with the text there, it's very, very short sentences, very direct storytelling style. Right, it's like right in your face with all the themes and very easy read. It's very easy read. Uh, it's very hard emotionally, but a very easy read just word wise, I guess. So I gave it five stars. Uh, I think it is just about as good a children's book as you're going to get. Yeah, my thoughts are Alex was wrong. I didn't hate the book. It was solid enough for what it was. Um, it's not something I would normally pick out to read and I probably won't read again. You know, Maybe I'll leave it up, you know, for the children to find someday and see if they'll read it. Had some interesting perspectives. Had a lot of, you know, like, this, like I said, the, the passive observer who just got things done to it. Edward's growth was you know, a slow and steady growth that felt, you know, realistic. Like, it wasn't like a, just a switch was flipped one day. It's not like, uh, and um, what's that first Thor movie when he can't pick up his hammer and he gets sense of Thor? Earth? Is it just Thor? I think it's just Thor, right? There's, there's no other subtitle to it. Just Thor. Thor. But it's like you get all you get to the the scene where you finally like you're about to get beaten by the bad big bad boss. So you haven't had any real growth, but also, oh, we gotta have the hammer so he can finally beat this boss and play the key the music and all oh he's all he figured it out <laughs> even though there was no real growth in it this story you know you could see the growth happening it was he was learning his lessons as he needed to learn them I, i'd say this alex uh edward's initial uh attitude was similar to adrian's from the liar maybe not the lying bit but just the narcissism yeah and then he grows and yeah. changes as a person <laughs> Adrian did kind of grow and change, just not in a good way. <laughs> he got he got worse. <laughs> That's very true. Also, Edward wasn't like graphically sexual and disgusting. <laughs> it is a children's story. I'm sure if we geared this towards adults, it would uh, be yeah, uh, let's, not, <laughs> let's not. <laughs> but yeah, so that's my kind of my final thoughts there. Ready for some questions, Alex? Lay them on me. See how you do. Why does Abilene love Edward so much? What emotion does Edward feel in return? So I guess, yeah, the important thing is, you know, why does... Because, I mean, people seem to feed off of Edward in some way. But in the beginning of the story, you know, he is so self-centered and vain. Why is Abilene apparently unaware of that, but still loves him? I think he's just like that comfort doll. Like, a lot of these people that Edward meets, they kind of push their own personifications onto Edward so the like what he's thinking and what Abilene's thinking are different and so she sees Edward like oh I love Edward and she can dress him up and play with him he's a toy and a doll and something that she can you know like you know, when you're that age sometimes your doll is your friend you know your best friend so um, I, I kind of looked at it as like she was treating Edward more as a family member like he was the little brother she always wanted yeah they'd have to like make a make a spot for him at dinner and yeah things like that yeah just because it's, uh, that was just the way she was treating him like like she, he was part of the family and so I think that's why she loved him because again like you said everyone was kind of putting their own um, wants of what they wanted and said she needed that you know that sibling to, to play with and she was, she was an only child I believe and so that was kind of, again, you know, that's what she needed right then and there. It's kind of like with uh, the fisherman and his wife, they needed that, that daughter again. What were your thoughts and feelings when Lolly decided to get rid of Edward? Uh, she is portrayed as someone who is very pushy and wants to force her perspectives onto her parents. Like, she's like... She saw her mother enjoying the company of a porcelain doll, and her reaction was to take the doll and throw it away because she thought it was stupid and made her look crazy. So, 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 so you know, kind of what visceral feeling did you get? Well, I think she's there. I think she's there. Actually, the note I made was like she, her character exists to teach Edward what it means to hate somebody and to have, like experience that hatred. Well, I don't think it was. 
I don't think this is he hated a lot of people or other uh, you know uh, toys already. Well, that was the first person like human being where I think he actually like says he hates her. Oh, yeah. See, I just got this visceral feeling like disgust towards her, like like she's so. You know, she's almost like the living incarnation of narcissism that Edward was, where it's all me, 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 and jealousy. And so she, she was very much like Edward, just in human form. Well, that's a good observation, yeah, because, like, even, like, you know, Bryce's dad has that brief moment of humanity. <laughs> like, she has nothing. She's just, yeah. she comes in, she's just total, total asshole. Yeah. You can see why Nellie is playing <laughs> playing uh, mother-daughter with Edward and, like, just trying to relive, relive a time when her daughter wasn't a total uh, yeah, and, and monster. Yeah, and, and Lolly's looking at it as a competition. Well, I have now another sibling, and I don't want that sibling. So, this, you know, almost the sociopathic, let's uh, throw the kid out in the trash and get yeah. rid of him. <laughs> yeah. Why does Bull describe him and Lucy as lost? And what does that mean? What does he mean by that? Well, I think he means it as, like, he doesn't fit in with a traditional, normalized society. Uh, he doesn't mean lost as, like, I don't know where I'm going, or uh, I don't know how to get where I'm going. I think he just means lost as, uh, I'm not part of what they're doing, and I'm doing my own thing, and we're just traveling around. And it's just more of an adventure than it is, like, being lost is usually a problem, but for him, being lost is an adventure. And he's going on an adventure through, uh, with Edward. See, I took it more as he lost his way in life because he does talk about how he ha had a family. He had two children and a wife and a job, and he just kind of walked away from it because he doesn't really give a reason. But it's not like, like he was kind of almost hinting that that's what he got lost from and that this big adventure he was on going, you know, going back and forth across the country was him trying to find his path again almost. Yeah, I was. I just thought it was like he enjoyed being lost. He liked rolling with all the other vagabonds and living that uh, la vie bohème. What is De Camillo saying about love when Edward is being used as a scarecrow and talking to the stars? Well, that's like his comfort mantra: the "I have been loved." So it's that thing that, like, even when you're going through the hardest times in your life, if you know that somebody out there loves you, it might help you get you through. Yeah, but if you look at the his feelings of the stars' response of they don't care, so what? And you know, because the stars are far away, they're cold, and they're kind of saying Edward should have cherished what was right in front of him instead of what's you know out there out of his reach. Because as I say, he keeps looking at the, he said that she kept using the stars as his theme, and he was always looking at the stars and looking, looking you know what could be better out there instead of the the love of the people that actually cared for him yeah it's like almost love is like in defiance to this great big cold universe that doesn't care like love is that thing like that keeps us going you know why had edward given up hope towards the end of the book do you think it was a good decision that he gave up that hope it's certainly understandable why he gave up hope he like he just experienced loss after loss throughout this entire story like he lost abilene he lost nelly he lost uh bull and lucy he lost yeah he lost sarah ruth and bryce like that's you know it's, it's a hard to do that and like that finality the finality of losing that many people over your life and having really nothing left of you you He's been stripped of his identity. No one's called him Edward for you know twenty years at that point, and he's you know, he's lost now in a bad way. So mm -hmm. it's you know when that happens in someone's life, it's com like you lose everyone you care about, and then you're alone, and you know it's it's tempting to give up, and it happened to him. Uh, I don't know if it, I don't know if it was a good thing. Like you obviously, I think they were going for more like emotional impact, like. This is what finally broke him. I don't know if it's like a good thing or a bad thing. Obviously, it works out for him in the end because he does get to see Abilene again. But I think it was kind of a... If a human loses hope, they tend to die. But Edward can't die. He's stuck. You know, even... You know, other than when he got smashed into you know, all the, the million pieces there, you know, they, he got brought back and he's still stuck in his body. And he, there's no way for him to end it. If you Have you ever read A Man's Search for Meaning? No. It's a... Uh, Nazi concentration camp story and basically um, I can't think of his name right now 
uh, the, the author, he was a psychologist uh, before he got you know, brought into the concentration camps. And basically, he's, you know, his look at it was the people that lost hope just died. So this is, you know, where Edward can't die, you know, losing hope doesn't, can't be the end for him. But it's that warning that, hey, if you lose hope, this is kind of your, where you're going to end up. And yeah, like he experiences that just eventual rebirth where Abilene finds somebody. Yeah, he's essentially dead by the end of the book and then he's recalled to life. I think it's the way I phrased it with Abilene finding him I I think it's... You know, an important bit. I it said it's a it's a warning to people that hey, if you if you go too far into losing hope, there is there could be no return from that. You gotta fight for that. You know, search for that meaning, search for that hope. You know, that, that thing that makes you want to keep you know struggling forward each day, and otherwise you're just gonna fade to nothing. On that happy note, we'll get to our. Uh, <laughs> It's got dark. It's uh-huh. like talking kids' books, and we're like, "Yes, if you give up on hope, you're gonna die." You're welcome, Alex. <laughs> I'm gonna bring you down to my level. <laughs> it's always fun. one of the reason I like reading books for kids this age because this is actually not too uncommon. There's usually a lot of heavy themes like this in really well written children's literature. You can learn a lot from those kinds of stories. Yeah, that's kind of kind of where this last question is gonna go. Uh, how does the author's story through the eyes of a porcelain doll feel more compelling to the readers than if the focus was of the story was on a actual person i do think it maybe softens the blow a little bit because like you see like bryce is suffering greatly throughout his whole life like he's he was suffering before he met edward and he's probably going to suffer long after he left edward's life like if we follow Bryce around, I don't, I don't know if that would be a story. Yeah, I, I think, I think Bryce's story is just a sad story where he probably ends up similar to his father, if not just dead at an early age kind of thing. You know, obviously it's a very different perspective. It's kind of similar to like Pinocchio or Toy Story, where you're, you're seeing it through the toy's eyes. But unlike those, where they can move and interact, obviously Edward can't, and it just kind of gives that you know screenshot into a bunch of different lives and what they're missing you know, in their, their lives, what their, their needs in their lives are. And, you know, his brief stints into their lives trying to f- fulfill that need, even though he doesn't, you know, he, he's kind of unwilling to fil- fulfill that need or even acknowledge, acknowledge that need. You know, that's what he is, that that's his niche, what he's filling in for. And I, I think from just a person's perspective, you're not going to, you know, even if you just follow one of these people, you're not necessarily going to understand that need as well, you know, through their eyes, because they probably don't see what they need either. They, they, the fisherman and his wife, they don't, they're probably unaware that they miss having a child. They're just living their lives and rolling with the punches, rolling with the waves, you know, and so this doll comes through and like, and fills this role of, oh, we're empty nesters and we needed this nest filled with something to, to you know, expand our love with not only with this other being but with each other with Bryce he needed that companion to help him through his uh, worst the worst moments moments of his life essentially you know the loss of his sister then basically starving to death on the street where I said yeah you get it taken from Bryce's point of view you just see this tragic figure but you're not getting as full of a picture of it it would be fun to do like a companion piece almost, like track uh, Abilene's life or you know, one of those characters. Yeah. yeah, I'll write. I'll write to the author. Maybe she can do that for yeah, us. Yeah, you do that. Then maybe we can interview her afterwards. Perfect. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Need more bonus episode content. Let's get this, you know, yeah. best-selling author on our show. That's all I got, Alex. If you have any more you want to add to either that question or something else. No, I think that's all I got too. Um, it's just a, an excellent book, and I highly recommend it. I recommend basically everything Kate Camillo's ever written. Like, you know, it's it's all really good. Yeah, I said, yeah, it's not that I didn't dislike this or didn't like this book. It's just it's not my style of book. You know, I said it's if I had read it as a kid, I probably would have enjoyed it. You know, I just uh, it's just not my not my my type. Joe's got a heart of stone. Yes, that's, if you can't tell. <laughs> It, it is uh, brittle, though, so don't hit it too hard. It'll shatter into <laughs> yeah. a million pieces. It's carbon fiber, actually. It's like it's, it's, it's just diamond. <laughs> yeah. So, yes, that has been the miraculous journey of Edward Tulane. 
Well, we did it a little bit of justice. There was a, there was a lot there to dive into for such a short book. Yeah, it's definitely dense and you know, com- yeah. in its compact form. It's yeah. there's not a lot. There's no fluff. Yeah, a lot like a true diary of a part-time Indian. Like, it's really hard to write a book like that where it's just like, and this is, I mean, it's two hundred pages, but it's basically a novella for like because it's such a quick read. Yeah. And there's not a ton of words on each page, so you just, you can plow right through it. So to be able like every word's got to count. So that's not an easy book to write. Yep. So that was Alex's last book for this season. Yeah. Fly, my season finale. We don't need to even need to read yours anymore. Oh, well, we're going to read it though, oh, just yeah. to just to torture Alex. Okay. <laughs> Tell us all yeah, about Alex, it. Alex, have you read this one yet? I have. I don't remember much about it though. So kind of like the liar. It's, you had read The Liar before, too. No, I know no, you had. I thought you had read The Liar and you didn't remember anything about it. Nope. Okay. Well, my last book is going to be a science fiction book, uh, a uh, space opera. It is the, I believe, the third one in the series, but these books are written in a way that you don't have to read them in order or read any of the other books to understand what's going on. The book is called Use of Weapons by Ian M. Banks. And, yeah, it is a... Don't read this if you're feeling depressed because you will feel depressed by the end of it because it is a very, I don't even know how to describe it. Just, it, it brings you down to the character's levels of men, you know, their mental space and it's, it's a ride. Yeah. Ian M. Banks, he's like a legend in the sci-fi community. The book of his that I remember the best was the wasp factory. Yeah. Which is, yeah, he does that book. is he, fucked up. Yeah. He, he does uh science fiction, but he also just does literary fiction. And so if you, you can tell if it's science fiction, because he puts the M uh, in his uh, name and in the literary, he leaves the M out. So I, you know, the wasp factory was his first book. He got published and I made Alex read that quite a while ago. And, it's it, been many years since I've read Ian Banks. And it's and that book is really good too. It's a little bit shorter, a little bit easier to read, but Ian M. Banks it, he has a thing with uh penises. I don't know, a lot of his books have this uh theme of uh a lot of sexual stuff, a lot of violence, and a lot of drug use. It sounds like it might be part of how his life was anyways. It sounds like he kinda had a messed up life. Yeah, I don't know anything about uh, yeah, him. Yeah, a little bit, a little bit. I've read about him. He, I was just gonna make a comment that like that's what gets books off the shelf. Yeah, but I said yeah, he, yeah. Having read a little bit about him, he wasn't the the nicest of people in the world to actually know. But his ability to get you sucked into a story and down to his level of depravity, uh, oftentimes is just like wow. You know, he he knew knows how to. He knows the study of human psyche and the dark places of those uh, parts of your brain. So, said if you're feeling depressed, probably best not to read this book. But if you want to get you know through a really great book, it is a thicker book. Alex is not looking forward to this after all of his uh, really short books he's been recommending at the end of the season. Yeah, I wanted to like you know ease into it. You know, get through the hard stuff first. You know, like. Start with the Nazi boys, and you know it's a thicker one, <laughs> and just like go easier from there. But no, Joe's like save the biggest, save, save the for hardest last. reads for last. Yeah, come on, yo, get, let people ease into the the reading challenges and work their way up to the hard reads. You know, I'm gonna make you read Finnegan's Wake. Next I'm not. Season. I'm not reading that one again. I've already read it once. I will understand it just as much as I did the first time. I'm sure, which is zero <laughs> percent. Like, I'm sure there's words on this page. <laughs> Oh, they're, they're, there's the words. They, they just and they they're strung together. They just it's gibberish, pure gibberish. But yeah, so we are Kindle bookworms. Alex, you have anything else you want to add in before I do our outro here? Um, no. Go ahead and uh, do the plugs. Okay. Obviously, you're listening to us. We are on every major podcast app that we can figure out how to get on to. We are on a YouTube. So check us out there. Hell it's just yeah. an audio, no video. Uh, our faces would break cameras, so no, you're not going to see us there. But we have an Instagram, at Kendall Bookworms. You can DM us there if you would like. Uh, any bonus episodes you would like us to potentially do, let us know. If, you want us, if you're an author you want to be interviewed, we'd love to do an interview. 
Uh, we have an email, kendallbookworms at gmail.com. You can contact contact us there with whatever thoughts and feelings you have. Thoughts and prayers. Thoughts and prayers. Uh, if you want to insult us on our uh, choice of books, go right ahead. We love uh, being dished. Uh, if we, you know, just insulted that Alex looks forward to it every time. I'm a glutton for punishment. I usually have uh, on Spotify some sort of poll or question for each episode. So definitely leave some uh, love there if you want. Rate us on Apple and Spotify. That will help get our word out. Recommend us to your friends and family. So let's, let's help us grow this show. You know, we're basically almost through season one here and looking forward to season two. Let's see if we can, can't double our audience. That would be awesome. What else do we got? Anything, Alex? I think you got it all. Okay, well, Alex has some, or a book published right now. He's got his other ones that are going to get republished eventually, I'm sure. Right, Alex? Yep. Right, right? Yep. I'm uh, working around the clock on them. Yes. Uh, Paul Plimpton versus Ragnarok. It's very good. Yeah, so check it out on Amazon. That will be in the link below. So, yeah, that's everything. Alex, it's good right. talking to you again. Good talking to you, too. Uh, and until next time, I'm Alex. I'm Joe. This has been Bookworms.